Hello again, race fans. That is uh, slot car nerds and non-nerds alike. We have some updates for you today. Uh, the latest goings on with the uh, facility. And when I say facility, I mean uh, the basement. Um, also, we uh, hey, we have uh, we have merch now actually. So uh, for those interested, check the description to get more information on that. Uh, but most importantly, we want to share with you the new club track for 2022. And we're pretty excited about having a, uh, a club track again. It's been a few years. We haven't had club races for a few years. Uh, we've had tracks, just not big club race track. Uh, you know, COVID didn't help at all. Um, but also, for those that don't know, uh, we've had our track on the floor for years and years and years. We decided we want to get that up off the floor to a table. In order to do that, we needed a, more space. Therefore, we changed the venue. And the new location didn't have quite the amenities that the old one had, so uh, we've been working on that, I don't know, basically like like infrastructure, I guess. So, um, but the new track is the biggest one we've done ever done as far as uh, overall track length. We have a couple elements in there that we've never done before, which are pretty neat too. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, we'll take you around and show you what's up. About that aforementioned infrastructure, I have a workstation set up now for the scoring system and there, there where I can set up the heat races, you know, add drivers and that kind of thing. And then uh, we've got an old data projector now installed and therefore we're projecting the uh, scoring up on the wall real big where everybody can easily see it. They don't have to squint to see a little tiny monitor, uh, although we, we still do need to get a, a real screen though. We have an update to our organizational system, which means now we actually have one. Uh, before, when we were putting a track together, we were sifting through just boxes and boxes of track and trying to find the right pieces. And, and sometimes it took a long time. It was frustrating. Uh, anyway, now we've got these cubbies here. Uh, they're all labeled for all the different pieces of track that we've got all in there. So much easier uh, to find what you're looking for now when we're putting a track together. Works great. Sometimes it's difficult to quickly identify a piece of track. And yeah, they do have it molded into the back, but that's difficult to read. So using a silver sharpie to mark your track for quicker identification is a big time saver uh, especially with the borders one of the things that we haven't replicated yet from the old venue is that magic wall full of beer and uh well no wall <laughs> yeah it's just this uh open framing here and uh, now there is some magic here but there's a problem i'll show you Soft drinks, yeah, soft drinks. Uh, so uh, we have uh, we have some tweaks to make, or maybe some adjustment or something, so that uh, this is beer instead. And this brings us to the track. And again, this is the longest track we've ever done, about 117 feet. And you'll notice right away that there's bridges in here. And I know some people don't like that; they think that it's uh, not realistic. Uh, but a couple things about that. Firstly, there are several full-scale racetracks that have bridges uh, or crossovers in them and secondly uh, as far as realistic goes slot cars aren't that realistic anyway they just don't really they don't scale down well you know the scale speeds are way off the scale length of a track is way off and besides who says that we're building a racetrack anyway this is illegal street racing downtown and what do you have downtown bridges I'm not going to go through the entire layout, just highlight a couple of key areas here. This turn looks odd because, uh, well, what happened in reality wasn't what happened on paper. And we've had plenty of layouts where we had nested turns, uh, a radius 1 inside of a radius 2 flat, and they're designed uh, to work that way just so you can have a, you know, a 4 or 6 lane track or whatever. Uh, but we thought having a, a flat radius 1 turn with a bank 2 all the way around it would be cool and according to the track planner that works and uh, that way that you'd have the inside edge of that two right along the outside edge of that one but when we went to put it together it didn't quite uh, uh, work out that way these bank turns always seem to throw you a curveball and uh, it turns out the diameter across 180 degrees isn't quite right and even though you've got some flexibility in the bank turns it still wasn't going to work 
And so instead of you know, redesigning the track to accommodate that, we ended up uh, having to put in a three bank here to start the turn and a three bank to end it and leave the two banks in the middle. So that's why this turn looks weird, but it works. We like large sweeping turns, so we incorporated a couple of them in this design. This one here is 90 degrees of a radius four. This next one is a 180 degree variable radius turn. It starts out with a one red, which is the sharpest turn, and then goes to a two, into a three, and eventually relaxes into 90 degrees of a four radius. And therefore, you can pick up speed going through the turn, and even if you start to run out of talent, your chances of holding on to the car are pretty good. Here's the pit, and as usual, we're using the dual pit lane setup, but this one is on the outside of a turn. Now we've had our pit on the inside of a turn before, on the straightaways plenty of times, but never on the outside, so something a little bit different. As always, we have the MAS here, so you can switch away from the exit of pit road to avoid the morons that aren't paying attention. We discovered something we didn't know before, and it's not good. Normally, when we build our dual pit, we'll put a piece of straight track in between the first pit entry and the second pit entry, and this just gives us a little bit more time to react to release the lane change button so we don't accidentally switch to the outside pit lane if we don't want to. But because of the space constraints on this layout, we had to remove it and just figured no big deal, we'll just be more careful when coming into the pits. Well, with this configuration, the 30 second scales still work just fine, but the 24 scales do not. Because of the length of the car, when this comes into the pit through the first pit entry, when it hits the second one, it's not squared up yet, and the emitter on the bottom of the car is not lined up with the sensor on the track. Basically, it's like you're coming into the pits in a skid, and so that will never activate the second gate to get you into the outside pit lane. So for now, at least with 24 scale, we'll just have to live with only using one pit lane. And something to keep in mind for any of you planning on having a dual pit, with 24 scale cars, you're going to need that straight section in between the first and second pit entry gates. Looks like they'll be starting some road construction in this area soon, so I guess we should be prepared for lane closures. We started out with four tables two years ago, and we added a fifth table to accommodate the club track, and along with the table extensions that we've got, that gives us a build area of 180 square feet. That's the equivalent of a 12 by 15 foot room, wall to wall, of build area. And it doesn't really look it, but the math says so. In this area, the track rises to go over two lanes of traffic, turns around, then comes back over the same two lanes of traffic. And instead of dropping that back down the table level again, or having a bunch of risers on that side, we just raise the whole table to make it a plateau. So the pits are elevated, and also that tech turn is elevated as well. We've been kicking this idea around for a long time and thought it might be dumb, which is exactly why we did it, which is we're going to make the track go subterranean. <laughs> so, so yeah, this traps down and runs underneath the table for about 12 feet. And this exits at the opposite end of the layout. So yeah, you do lose sight of your car for a couple of seconds, which is why we put a number three bank at the end of it. So that way, if it takes you a split second or two to kind of pick up on your car as it's coming out of the tunnel, at least you're not going into a, a high risk element. You might think it'd be difficult to reacquire your car as it comes out of the tunnel, but actually not really. We've run a ton of laps on this track now and have yet to get confused about uh, you know, when your car's coming out or confusing it with somebody else's car. And so the whole idea of having this tunnel here is not as dumb as it might sound. This is actually working out pretty well. Some of the cars with a low downforce, uh, basically the ones that we took the magnets out of, uh, you need to be careful with because uh, they will leave the track coming out of this tunnel. Syria, actually, pay attention. We got a... <laughs> Uh, traffic's going this way where we have a lane changer and uh, we figured with the uh, exit of the tunnel right there good idea to put a guardrail up there so you don't end up uh, punting somebody into that tunnel so uh, be sure to stick around for the race footage where you can find out whether or not that guardrail is tall enough or not we got some of the guys from the club coming over to run some laps with some 24 scale cars and uh, this is not an official club race. Uh, we're just going to run some laps to kind of 
test out the track uh, to see if it's going to work for, for club racing. So we have footage of that, and that's coming up next. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the updates, the walkthrough, and the race footage. Let us know what you think about the track in the comments, and we'll see you next time.